Hello, everyone, and welcome. This is Techno Crime Fighters Forum, episode number 53. I'm Ramola D, and I'm here this morning with Dr. Catherine Horton and with uh, NSA whistleblower Karen Stewart. Hi, everyone. And um, we're so sorry we're late again this morning, you know, as usual, trying to get on, trying to battle various interference issues and so forth. And I think uh, Catherine had an issue with the uh, time. I think the time is a little bit different in Europe, right, Catherine? Um, you haven't changed back or whatever. We've, we've uh, done the spring forwarding already, falling forward or whatever. We've, we've changed our time here in the US. Um, so anyway, so sorry we're late, but we're here and we promise to um, be as concise as possible. Um, once again, just to give the usual spiel as to uh, what we do over here, we are um, a group of human rights advocates who are speaking out about surveillance abuse in the USA and in Europe and around the world today, and about the use, the illegal, illegitimate, and unwarranted use, and sadistic and torturous use, I should add, of uh, all sorts of ghastly electromagnetic weapons that are being used in civilians all over the world, in the US and all over the world. Um, and when we say electromagnetic weapons, we mean microwave weapons, millimeter wave weapons, sonic weapons, scalar weapons, um, all sorts of stealth radiation weapons that are being used on people. And uh, going hand in hand, hand in hand with this is um, covert implantation that the intelligence agencies are carrying out on populaces. And um, what else? Neurotechnology. So not only are people being hit with directed energy weapons on their bodies, on various parts of their bodies, they're also being hit in the brain with deadly neurotechnology that is putting synthetic images, synthetic dreams, um, you name it, you know, replacing people's senses, taking over people's motor cortex and messing with their arms and legs and um, fingers and toes and so forth, bio-robotizing. Biohacking and brain hacking is um, in vogue, apparently, among the covert crowd, and they are happily experimenting on the populace. These are ghastly, ghastly things, and uh, people do need to speak openly about them. And people need to, we certainly are calling for things like a, a, a ban on these electromagnetic weapons, and we will um, talk about that a little bit today. So these are terrible weapons, and certainly these are the kinds of things people need to speak out about and other people need to listen to and report. And, uh, you know, we are here to, I guess, do both. So welcome. And um, I'm going to turn the floor over to Karen so she can, um, you know, take it off. She has some great ideas about how we can bring begin to bring this to the notice of our so-called um, leaders, our uh, Congress people and so forth, and uh, Senate Intelligence Committee, etc., and how we can begin to demand action um, on this situation. So um, Karen, go Well, I did ask people uh, maybe a month ago to give me a last page from my uh, take us off the kill list letter and petition. And the petition on I petition actually is up to 600 people, so I was very happy to see that, even though the White House one closed before we got the requisite 2,000 minimum. But it still exists on I petition. So if you could go over there and try to find the kill list petition, that would be great. But I've taken that uh, letter, which originally was a letter, turned it into petition. And then I'm taking the letter again, as I've told people, and I will be sending it out to different entities. What I've asked people to do is print a new last page on it that says I, and they put their name, so-and-so, would also like to be taken off the kill list based upon the laws that are stated in Mrs. Stewart's letter. And um, I've gotten, I don't know, probably close to a dozen people giving me the last page. So I've already taken a batch and sent it off to the Department of Justice and gotten back a letter that pretty much said, we don't know what to do with this. So I said, okay, so what I'm going to do is put a cover letter and explain to these nitwits what it is that they need to do with this. And we've been talking about the fact that, um, you know, the FBI, while it seems to be under the Department of Justice, may actually be using the Department of Justice as little marionettes. So the Department of Justice, while looking like it's supposed to be have um, oversight, they may, they may be out of the loop. And I, and I read an article where it says the FBI 7th floor, which is where the, uh, the management is, pretty much uh, uh, considers the sitting president now as the enemy. So that tells us we are in a full-fledged 
civil war behind the scenes. And if you look at, <clears throat> excuse me, if you look at YouTube and read various um, titles and then go into those uh, YouTubes and, and listen to what they're talking about, there seems to be a lot going on behind the scenes. And I tell people, please take heart, wait, be patient. Because if you've got, if you do have a sitting president who is at war with the deep state, He's not going to come out and tell the country we're in a war with the deep, deep state. You know, things are going to be happening behind the scenes because you don't want people to panic and, you know, riot in the streets, disrupt commerce, disrupt traffic, uh, attack neighbors, you know, because this is this person's red or this person's blue. You know, you don't want full out chaos. So this type of usurpation of a sitting president is going to be fought you know it's surreptitious it's stealth so it's going to be fought surreptitiously and with stealth um so things are going on if you if you pretend you're in the soviet union and those people basically said when we watched the news we knew not to believe what we were hearing we knew to start piecing together what was not being said and to read between the lines so we could figure out exactly what was going on in the country well, we are in exactly the same position. So I would say go to YouTube and start looking at who's saying what. Um, and are they backing each other? Who's backing each other? Is one wildly out of step with several? You know, um, is this in line with the mainstream media? Or is this giving us information we're not really hearing? And does this, this make maybe a little bit more sense? So um, go to go to YouTube and start you know, piecing together and listening to get an idea of what's going on, because I think it'll make you feel encouraged. I mean, we're, it's not going to be easy. This is not, you know, we're not going to have a solution next week. Things are very definitely heating up and going on. So just kind of take, take a deep breath and try to keep focused and try to keep your, I mean, the Bible says basically guard your heart. So do guard your heart. Do not become discouraged. Because things are getting better. Things are, we've got, we've got somebody fighting for us. So think about that. That's a big change over the last several decades. Okay. But anyway, getting back to these letters, you know, I have collected yet more. And I will be making um, multiple copies of everybody's signature page. And I will keep sending them off to uh, different military, different agencies. And we're going to see what kind of response we get. And then if, if I see, oh, I didn't include this or I should have said that, then I'm resending it to see if I can get a better response. And we're going to whittle it down to see who it is I really should be talking to and how it is that I should be making this demand. So that is the project that I'm doing right now. Um, I'm also helping with uh, a targeted justice. So that's another avenue that, that uh, I find very hopeful. Um, and I continue to write to anybody I think can help us and see what kind of response we get. So um, I do take uh, suggestions, like somebody says, hey, why don't you look into this organization or why don't you contact this person? I do take note of it and I do try to write a letter. Um, I'm also writing uh, individual letters for people um, and then keeping that without their name on it to see if we can use it elsewhere. Like one particular lady asked me to write a letter to an, organ, uh, an organization, and I'm trying to think of the, it's um, SMHCA, I think, something like that. But they are basically an organization that deals with mental health issues and substance abuse issues. Because she, when she wrote to the authorities, to say I'm being gang stalked and I'm being harassed, they said, they forwarded her letter to this organization because they saw, thought it was so outlandish, outlandish and outrageous. So I wrote her a letter to send, signed my name, my credentials, and and basically blasted these people. You know, I said, you know, you cannot be professionals um, with concrete ideas in an elastic world. You've got to open your minds to the fact that things are changing, people are changing, society is changing, and you cannot blow off people because it isn't what you've seen for the last 40 years, you know. So she found that useful, and I posted it without her name, 
uh, on my Facebook, just in case anybody wanted to use any part of it for themselves and write to maybe a state mental institution or anybody they felt was um, um, w that it was appropriate to give to, because I really kind of took them to task. You know, I said, you know, you're basically sitting on scientific notions that this is like this, this, and this. And I said, and current science uh, hundreds of years ago also told us the earth was flat. But they found out that was not right. And you will find out that you are not right. So, um, again, I, I try to, when somebody gives me a, a specific need, I try to, to meet it. And I try to also try um, think of how to formulate the letter so that it can be used by others. So we're, we're building a little bit of a repertoire. So um, um, that was happy that she, that was, made me happy that she looked at the letter and she said, yes, I like it. I can use it. So um, that, that was a, that was an accomplishment this week that I think I'm, I'm happy with. But like I said, I take, you know, suggestions and um, try to help in any, any way that I can. So if you have, a situation and I write a letter, maybe somebody else can use that letter. You know, I'm very ha happy to vouch for you and put my credentials out there. So I'll throw it back to you for a while. <laughs> That's great. Thanks so much, Karen. That's pretty brilliant that you're, that, that you're writing letters like that and putting them out there and that you're posting it on Facebook so people can actually have access to it at any time. And I tell them, use any part of it, use the whole thing, use any part um, of it. I think letters mm -hmm. and I think letters from you in particular would be pretty great, you know, just to attach your name to it and state that you you said this or, you know, that, that if they're quoting a part of your letter or if you, you know, gave them a letter yourself, you know, that would be great. And maybe what we should do is get a letter from you and put it on our JIT letterhead as well, you know, so we can send it out to as many people as might need it. Because very frequently, every now and then, I think each of us gets requests for a letter. And, um, you know, if we just collected our, all the various letters that we all wrote and, you know, stuck the letterhead on there, it would be, might be useful for people. I think that's that's a brilliant idea. I had um, two questions. Actually, I'm um, talking about... Um, you know, I, I, you know, two things. The first one I wanted to suggest is that um, because this is a, a brilliant campaign and it is an entire campaign in itself, I wanted to suggest, um, so let me just show you. Um, what I did, um, I was trying to tidy up my website a little bit. And then uh, these days when you when you go there, so you just have the, the news at the top. And then if you scroll down, there's the burning down the house of crime. So all our campaigns here, and um, it's still, it's just, I've just started. So um, what will go here? So this was the memo to Donald Trump, you know, um, in the beginning, then the tsunami email campaign. Um, what I wanted to insert is the current um, campaign for Millicent, and then there will be a campaign for Siegfried Thomas here. But I wanted to make an entire page so that when people go here, they can see that it's actually one of the, um, one of the big campaigns that we're running so that, um, you know, when people think about how to help, they can just go there and straight away see, oh, okay, this is where we're up to. I wanted to put all the petitions there so that people can just say, okay, I want to sign this, 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 and this. And, um, and then I also want to send letters here, 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 and here, you know? That's one idea I had. And the other thing I wanted to- That's ask great, Catherine. That's really useful to just put it all together. And I know we've all kind of been so busy, we've been unable to sort of set up a separate techno page. So it's fabulous you're doing it. Thank you. So one of the things, I, but I, I, this is just my private page. So I wanted to collect stuff for the JIT page. So I, um, I made a, a page for techno here and one for the JIT, but also under the FAQ, what I was trying to collect, if people scroll down to the information pack, is I've now uploaded the affidavits of all the um, the major um, uh, intelligence whistleblowers I could find, and I'm I'm sure that there are you know um, statements that I still need to add. But I've put in the affidavit by William Binney, Ted Gunderson, Gerald Sosby, um, the interview with Carl Clark, and the affidavit by Andrea Davison, um, and all of these um, former intel agents are basically making statements about different aspects of this this huge um, crime cartel. So I wanted to make the um, put all the documents together and the ideas because these uh, affidavits are freely available. I want people to just be able to go here and then when they make their court bundles, you can just click and download the documents straight away and put it straight into your court bundle. So my idea was 
that um, perhaps Karen, you could, um, you know, if you want to write an affidavit like like the other guys did, and 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 maybe also talk about all the stuff that you talk about on Techno, which is the directed energy weapon attacks, because I think Gerald Sosby talks about that he is being attacked with them. But then the more intel agents come forward and say, well, I, I was attacked, the more um, we have actually, and written documents are so much better for court use than um, you know um, anything up online, then people can just print it off. And then, I mean, already now we have, you know, when we put it all together, it's quite a lot of evidence we have. So, you know, maybe that yes. would be, you know, to actually, but you know, not like all out, um, you know, the, the full um, length testament affidavit, but just like something, very very short one or two pages just uh you know that would be fantastic yeah and you know C catherine that's pretty brilliant you could also add a whistleblower testimony to that same list perhaps yes i i basically i, I invite um anybody who has a pdf an affidavit or statement or testimony that uh, can be used in court please send it to me on contact at um, stop007.org because I want to put all this together. So I'm, I'm now ramping up this preparation for the court bundles. And my dream, <laughs> my dream is that I'll have this page finished and every um, bit of evidence that I'm using and giving to a judge, I'm also putting up there so that people can just download it. I'll show you how to make a court bundle. And then ideally uh, one could do a court bundle in a day and just say, okay, this, 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 and this, boom, print it off, take it to the high court, get an injunction. That's the idea. That's what I'm working towards. But this is worth gold, all these sort of documents. Well, I think there's also a template. I mean, I've written a, a, a testimonial, basically, but I'll have to go back and make sure that I have things in it that a court requires, like saying that you're sound of mind, giving your birth date or something, whatever it is that they require so that it doesn't get thrown out on a technicality. So I will investigate that further and I'd be glad to put up a, a, some kind of testimonial saying, you know, this is my background and this is what has happened to me. And, you know, I'm thoroughly vetted. Sorry, I haven't gone crazy in the last 10 minutes, you know. Absolutely. And I think we also have a database this big about fraudulent uh, psychiatric so-called diagnoses that people had to retract very quickly. I mean, there's Melanie's, for example, when she was locked up for a week and at the end of the week they had to release her because the psychiatrist couldn't find anything. You know, if, if you're looking at somebody for a week and you can't find anything, you were probably wrong all along. And the same with Frederick Laroche, uh, he was locked up and they couldn't find anything. So because, you know, Dr. Bigoshi was wrong, or I personally think a lying, you know, cartel agent, but that's my opinion. Um, but, you know, on and on it goes. So, And in Melanie's case, in fact, you know, did you know that the, the supposed psychiatrist who was supposed to give her that second independent psychiatric assessment turned out to be just a GP? Yes, she wasn't even a psychiatrist. Exactly. Wasn't that's even a psychiatrist. And, you know, so that's such evidence of such glaring fraud, you know? I guess the veterinarian wasn't available. <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't bark. That doesn't seem... Yeah, really, or the entomologist. <laughs> <laughs> you know? So it just goes well, to show how the, the big fat lie that psychiatry is pulling off on people. And in these big hospitals, these big name hospitals in the heart of Brussels, Belgium. Yeah. So if you're ever shocking. in a hospital and they demand to have a psychiatrist come in and evaluate you, maybe you ought to ask the person, are you a psychiatrist or are you the janitor? <laughs> you know? Frankly, uh, right. well, it might have more of a skill, you know? Yeah, yeah. Maybe ask for the qualifications, you know. Yeah. Well, we had just before this uh, program started, we've been talking about the fact that after the school shooting in Florida, um, the state of Florida uh, um, has started to confiscate guns and ammunition from people local sheriffs and police deem mentally unstable. Okay. And I just about, I mean, had I been drinking coffee or something, I would have spewed it all over the table. Because of my experience with Florida, I said, for Pete's sake, you know, the average policeman has an IQ of 104. Sheriff's deputies are lower. All right, these are people who can tie their shoes, maybe, okay? But these are people who are making the judgment as to whether Bill Smith over here is mentally fit to have a nine millimeter gun and ammunition, all right? 
when I was trying to tell the Leon County Sheriff's Department that my family is being hit with directed energy weapons, I sent them a cavalcade of articles and links to their existence and to their abuse. They didn't get it. They tried to Baker Act me. They sent me to a psychologist for the state of Florida. He said, get out of here. You don't belong here. All right. As I've said before, I had multiple tests to even get into NSA and stay in NSA. And all of them, you know, passed every single psychological evaluation, period. And I have two independent psychologists who said there's nothing wrong with her. And I was told by a sheriff's deputy, okay, let me see if I can get the face right. Well, I disagree. So these are the people who are making the decision that so-and-so might be mentally unfit. The people who can barely tie their shoes and they're given guns. So how brilliant you know, is that? Oh my God. You, you, know, you know, Karen, that I think we should launch a full-scale frontal attack on this blistering notion of Baker acting people just because they mentioned directed energy weapons. You know, it's like, you can mention UFOs. You can say a little green man came in through my window, you know, the last night, and nobody's going to baker at you. But you just have to open your mouth and say, I'm being hit clearly by, you know, electromagnetic pulse energy that's coming in from outside, and off to the psych ward you go. What kind of lunacy is that? And how, who the heck does the police department think they are to do this to people? You know, are they arresting anybody for saying they believe in nightingales or frogs who croak at night? I mean, what on earth? So, and, and the, the, que the question you raise as to level of education is actually very, very apt. I'd like to know, what are the basic qualifications for somebody to become a policeman? For a deputy, it's um, making it through high school. And we okay. know what a joke so you have that these is. You have these people who barely finished high school, who entered the police force, coming around arresting, you know, linguists and people with PhDs and people with MDs just because they made the educated and independent and intelligent judgment that they're being hit with electromagnetic energy. That simply doesn't sit right, does it? And I showed these bozos a meter reading and they, and they said, and let me see if I can get the face right. Oh, we don't know what that means. So of course they don't. That, they didn't go to a college. <laughs> this is so funny. This is so funny. By the way, I mean, I mean, I have to say that there are some people you know, like in New York City in the common room who also can pull a face like that. But I mean, not this guy. Good God. I mean, I, I'm not sure how. I would like to know the measurement uncertainties on this IQ of 100, you know, 104 for police officers. I'm still I'm still convinced that might have been their body temperature and far enough, <laughs> you know. But um, I, I, I actually, um, the more I know about Baker acting, the more I'm warming to it. I'm just thinking that they are Baker acting the wrong people. But I'm, I'm pretty sure that we have a lot of people who are clinically insane, you know, floating around. And it's, it's true. We need to lock them up and, and take their guns away as quickly as possible. But I think what we should do is, I mean, as always, we have a, we have a choice. We can either, you know, be standoffish or we go right, right into the melee. And we really try to start fighting on their own terms. Um, so why don't we just go in and we start Baker acting? People like, I don't know, Michael Hayden, could he be make Baker acted, you know, for total insanity? Or, uh, God, I would have a list, right? I would also have plenty of evidence to back it up. Unless... Well, you see, that's the, the, this is exactly the irony of it, Catherine. The people who should be Baker acted are the ones who set up the Baker Act. So, you know, the, the people in the local police station, the local sheriff's department, the local fusion center, and, um, you know, this, the mayor's office, the city council, etc. those are the ones who think that they should go around Baker acting people who speak out about being covertly implanted and being hit with electromagnetic energy weapons. When in actual fact they are using electromagnetic energy weapons on this populace and you've got people you know we've all talked about our neighbors sitting around in these crack fusion houses right sitting around with stealth radiation weapons so actually when you said people need to be bay corrected and their guns taken away from them i think what we need to say is you know their dues need to be taken away from them their directed energy weapons their portable dues the the new age microwave emitters that they're all sitting and operating from inside their houses the little military tracking radar weapons where they're flickering people's nerves with, you know, and sending people electric shocks. So the little shockers and uh, emitters need to be taken away from them.
But how do we move from, you know, step A to step B? Because we've got the, the guys installing the emitters running the Baker Act on the population. So, you know, it's a, it's a bit of an issue. It's a bit of a problem. It's, it's well, sorry. Oh, I was going to say, you know, at the point where somebody says, oh, that we want to Baker Act you, you just say, really, because I would like to IQ Act you, you know, because I would like to make sure that you even have the intellect to understand what that means because your stupidity does not equate to my insanity, you know? That is actually brilliant. Show me your Maybe IQ we need to put that on a blue card, like a little poster. Uh, yeah. how, how did you say, Karen, your, your, um, stupidity. your stupidity doesn't what? equate to my insanity? I, I think we should print t-shirts like that. And <laughs> I want it on my mind. Yes. Seriously, I, I think this is the key. We could turn it into a slogan. Well, we I've, could. I started referring to the sheriff's department as the sheriff's de department. <laughs> and I've begun uh, spelling Florida at the end with D U H. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah, it's not DHS. But you know what? I can I can second that, Karen, because I'm about to publish the phone calls I made to uh, Chief Potts and uh, Troy Potts, so the the chief and captain of uh, Columbia um, Police in Tennessee. And my word, do they sound like country bumpkins? You know, I'm sorry. That's what we call them over here. You know, I, it's absolutely shocking. And I'm and and also from last week. Um, you know, we know that this guy, um, I'm now convinced that uh, Chief Potts is in on the human trafficking. Because when he said, you know, oh, he said to Millicent, who was scared for her life, and still is, um, and said, oh, well, you know, when you die, we just move on to your daughter. You know, I exactly what he basically put in, in words, and we know that Millicent never lies, is that, is that he's in on it. He's in on the human trafficking. So I would say that with these people, we have to attack them frontally. And not even engage in their stupid uh, games, but, uh, you know, we just have to put down as the very first uh, axiom that every organization can be infiltrated and has a certain error rate where they recruit criminals, corrupt people, psychopaths or clinically insane people. That's a given. OK, so by the laws of system physics. So then the question is, well, what do you do when you detect somebody like that? And I think we should just start accusing them and say, I think you're a criminal. I think you're clinically insane. And here's the evidence we have. You know, these are the irregularities. And then actually, they got And I think one, I, I, I totally agree. And, and I think one big um, step, one big facet of this, of, of this sort of system judo operation, as you would call it, Catherine, is to report on it, to report what they are doing. Um, you know, I don't know if you guys saw my podcast last week with um, John Wedger, who's from Scotland Yard, former detective from the London Metropolitan Police. Wow. Police whistleblower, Godwin's friend, he introduced me to him. Yes, unfortunately, Jeff couldn't come massive interference that day of course Friday morning when I was trying to take this but I ended up having a conversation with John Wedger alone and so you know he talked about the kind of work that he was doing so what he has been doing and what he's learned about London is that child trafficking child prostitution is rampant and the child protection slash predation system is in large part responsible for, you know, literally setting loose these children on the streets and um, who are being exploited massively. Guess what? Guess who they're being exploited by? They're being exploited by the so-called creme de la society, by the judges, the politicians, etc. And so when John Wedger began to find out, you know, some of the gory details of what was going on, guys in his own police force, senior police, uh, one senior police officer told him, you've got to stay off the subject. Stop talking about it. Don't touch it, or you'll be in deep shit, and so will we. Like the whole force, the whole hey, station. Hey, this is Can you believe it? Oh, okay, okay. I've got some you stuff to talk about that. As first of all, before I say anything, I want everybody to go to Ramola. He reports on the YouTube channel, and she's referring to report number fifty-four, John Wedger. Okay, here, right? That's the one you you mean. So this is absolutely fantastic. And I really encourage everybody to listen to it. I have to listen to it because I didn't have time last week. But uh, the, the, what's absolutely, gosh, I'm so glad. I'm so glad we have this in now because this can be backed up. The other police officers who said the same thing. 
And then as there's also, by the way, most people don't know, but they know Dr. Barry Trust, the microwave weapon expert, you know, talking about Wi-Fi and um, the dangers of 5G and so on. And everybody should listen to that. But he also worked um, undercover for some time. And I think he was placed into a school and he talks about that as well. So I have to dig out that interview. But he says that um, he was put into, was it a school or he was teaching at a college or something? I think it was teaching at a college either way. He was, um, I think he was sent, uh, and the, one of the tasks he had was to sniff out people who were pedophiles, okay, or who might be actually um, trying to pick up these boys and on the weekend, uh, something like that. I'm not sure if it was a boarding school, but I have to listen to the interview. But the bottom line is that um, Barry Trow was basically sent to, to sniff out these pedophiles and then he found them because they would just, you know, pick up uh, boys on a Friday and bring them back Sunday night, you know, on Monday early morning or something like that. And these boys would come back with a lot of cash, you know, and presents and so on and so on. So you can imagine what was going on. Um, but then uh, Dr. Barry Charles says that um, what happened is that, um, you know, the, the entire report was taken from him and then just filed away. And when I heard the interview, I wanted to say, well, Barry, the one thing you have not considered, I mean, he probably has considered, he just didn't say it publicly, but that's why I will say it publicly, is that it wasn't that he was pulled off the case. No, finding the pedophiles for blackmailing ma material was the whole freaking point of this Intel organization from as it was um, incepted at the top. But he was used to get the data, the so-called policing data, but the policing was never done. Nobody ever did anything about the pedophiles. It was just to con um, um, generate the control files. I think that that's what happened, you know? And these police officers think that, oh, well, you know, they're doing policing and then eventually somebody pulls them off. Well, guys, I tell you, pedophilia has been going on for millennia. Your bosses already know what this is about, right? I mean, by the way, the London police officers have the Masonic tiling on their caps, okay? You guys are policing the Masonic, the floor of the Masonic temple. No one wants to put an end to the pedophilia higher up. What this is about, it's about pulling in the control files so that these people can be then, you know, controlled. I think that's what it's about. Mm -hmm, exactly. Yeah. And so, that's what he was reporting, that basically the higher-ups wouldn't touch it and, in fact, retaliated against him and against others. I mean, he's been talk he, he talked about some, you know, horrific things. One of his younger sons was, uh, was targeted, um, almost died, you know. So, um, terrible things. And, um, but despite all of that, I mean, you know, hats off to John Verger for sticking through and continuing to hold his ground and continuing to speak out and continuing to research the subject and so forth. Now he's connecting with other police whistleblowers and they're trying to work together to speak out. But one of the things that he talked to me about was, you know, we need support from the public. We need the public to support us because it's like the higher ups won't support them, you know, so they need you and me to support them. I, so I, I think that's a very important point, actually. I, I think you're absolutely right. This is a super important point. And I just want to encourage him to um, actually do, I mean, I, I thought it was really great when, I think it was Wiltshire Police. Unfortunately, I forgot the name of the um, of the officer, but he went public on YouTube and he put out a, a public appeal. And he said that the uh, investigation is ongoing and they are please asking that there's no inter external, in external interference, you know, from above or from outside. Um, and, and that was really good when the police is communicating directly with the people through their own YouTube channel, bypassing, you know, the higher ups. I think that's worth gold, but they have to bypass the higher ups. And sometimes people in the service can't do that. You know, I mean, the worst is when the police tries, pretends that they are talking to the public. And then in the background, you've got all the Masonic, you know, sim symbolism. That's nonsense. What we need is the actual true um, investigations. But one of the things I would like to say to uh, to John Major is that one of the things that would really be worth gold is that all the police officers first go public and you know say everything you need to say on on interviews uh, wherever you can. But the second step, you should also write an affidavit because as soon as it's written and notarized, it can be used in any jurisdiction, and then suddenly we can all use it on court cases. You know, and the other thing that helps him is also this news article that came out um, in The Guardian, which was about the, um, uh, it was something like the, the uh, police reforms are being blocked by the Freemasons in the police force. 
something like that. So free makes sense for lead for I recall that, yes, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and I think that must our, have been when we were focusing on the Freemasons in our conversations, you recall. Oh, exactly. I mean we do, you know, Ramona, you do have a voice here. I, I found the article because they you know, something we bring up will be then, you know, splashed through the media sometime later. Hang on, bring, let me bring up the article. It's this one here. So Freemasons are blocking reform, says police federation leader. You know? Um, that's that's absolutely right. And um, actually, um, one of the things that I, I did a while ago is I'm, I'm putting together a little presentation on cartel signaling, uh, not, not because it's my pet hobby, but because I'm trying to educate people about it and its importance. And uh, let me just flash up one image here, which is uh, what I was talking about earlier. So for those people who are not in the UK and have never seen um, a police cap, this is what the British police cap looks like. Okay, so what you have here is the black and white Masonic tiling, clear as day, day, okay? So the police force is not, a, a, by conception, not there to protect the people. It's there to protect the, the cartel from the people. So th these people are policing the floor, the bottom rung of the Masonic temple, and that's us. We're the pawns on the chessboard, okay? That's why. But just because people design it, that it doesn't mean we have to stick with it. So we're changing the system. That's, abs <clears throat> that's absolutely right. And actually, I think you just spelled out, Catherine, how important it is actually to figure out their signals and signs and their symbols, primarily to understand their motivation and to understand what they're doing and also to kind of signal to them that once we read their signals, the power of their signals and symbols is completely dissolved. I mean, seriously, once you can see through something or someone or somebody's nefarious activities, that's the first step toward dissolving and crumbling their power to bits, you know? So this whole thing about uh, when the higher ups, when the Freemasons inside the police force do not support those outstanding police officers who notice the horrors and are trying to stop the horrors of child abuse and child exploitation and, you know, people needing to come forward. In a sense, what we can achieve if the people come forward, if the public comes forward, and, the, and the, there are simple ways to support somebody like John Wedger. One is he does have a GoFundMe page where he, um, he actually went on a walk, you know, to kind of advertise child exploitation and he was you know he said he received a lot of support in the walk but if when when the police when police whistleblowers do something like that something public like that that's an opportunity for the public to step forward and support them a long way etc things like that um or you know just in kind through donations to help people to help these police whistleblowers most of whom are retired perhaps or who've lost their place in the force you know, in some way to monetarily help them and help what they're trying to do, because what they're trying to do is educate the public. So they are doing, I think, as you were suggesting, um, Catherine, speaking out, going and giving talks here and then so forth. I think that particular day, um, John was getting ready to catch a flight to Scotland to go give a talk somewhere. So that would be fantastic if we could help support that, you know, financially, etc. And um, the thing about writing an affidavit, I think we should send him a note and tell him that. Perhaps, you know, perhaps he's working on one already, but that would be fantastic if he put it in, you know, in a document for other people to use, certainly. But um, the thing that all of this, uh, the effect, I think, that all of this has when they come forward and they do something and we support them a little bit, I think it has the effect of pushing back, you know, pushing back the illicit, illegal, illegitimate, power-hungry lunatics out there, the, the Freemasons and so forth, who are sitting on top of this hierarchy and trying to exert control and power continuously. So we are, I think, offering push back, right? And hopefully we are helping to push back that uh, kind of tide of evil and corruption and crime. So I know some people say you can never stop things overnight. You can't change things overnight. Uh, but some yeah. additional That's not to wrong. look at it, you know, what would be to happen, right? You can, you can. And I've got an example for that. And that is, I think, in the middle of the 1970s, Sweden, I think it was Sweden, and I think it was in the middle of the 1970s, but anyway, uh, Sweden in the middle of the 1970s changed overnight from driving on the uh, left-hand side to driving on the right-hand side, I think. Most people don't know that, but in Europe they used to drive on the other side, I think. 
And they did do that overnight. So system changes overnight are possible, but they take uh, a lot of preparation and everybody has to agree that the system change has to happen. You know, I love that. And didn't the and didn't Iceland kick out the bankers? Yes. Oh, yes. we did. Yes. And, and that one of the things I wanted to highlight about that, because there's an excellent uh, documentary about that, which is called um, Ah, there, there are two that I really like. One of them is called The Four Horsemen, which is freely available on YouTube. And I ask people to really watch that. It's great. And then there's another one, which was, I think it's called The Global Meltdown or something, both about the financial crisis. But there, they show the Icelandic um, prime minister. But what I want to highlight in our context is that when he was fighting the bankers and trying to kick them out, he surprisingly, out of the blue, was diagnosed with cancer. So I think the banksters attacked him with dues, with directed energy weapons. But, you know, I, I want to highlight this because it is not true that, oh, this just happened and it's in the past and we can't do anything. No, this is all data. I'm trying to make people think in terms of data on the cartel this time. Oh, they have all the data on us, but now we need to get the data on them. And um, when anything in a physical system, if you take some sort of action, you know, like a cartel, you know, there's assets moving or something. It always leaves traces, and the traces are inscribed in the system forever after. So when you know where to look, it will be inscribed in the system. The data will be there, and once you know, okay, are being used, uh, you can go back in time. Sorry, I get so much feedback. Sorry, I just wanted to say one more thing. Um, when you go back in time, you can pick out all these cases where people develop cancer. So the Icelandic prime minister's cancer, I think, should be flagged because it was highly, highly timed. Yes, it could be possible that, oh, he was slowly developing cancer. And just as he was fighting the banks, it got so bad that he noticed he went to the doctor and found out. Yeah, well, that's possible, but, you know, uh, statistically less likely, right? Because it's timed. It's always timed towards the same year, the same months where something is happening. So for the cartel, taking people out with cancer or delaying their work, you know, through chemotherapy is worth gold. But statistically, you can have cancer whenever, right? Or you can find out whenever. So these high um, time correlations, we always have to spot. Plus, the other thing is also that um, I think um, with Gerhard Ulrich, the, the Swiss uh, anti-corruption campaigner, there was the first time I really, um, you know, um, uh, flagged up something was when he told me he was trying to inform the entire community about I think it was the corruption of this Freemason arsonist and then he, in Switzerland you you know the people live everywhere they live up at 1400 sometimes at 700 meters you know so when you're distributing leaflets to homes you have to sometimes climb a mountain and you know get up there so he was saying that during the day he was just distributing leaflets in the middle of the of the sun you know, in the midday sun, he's climbing up to 1,400 meters. He was fine. He didn't have a problem. And then in the evening, you know, he still felt fit, he said. Um, when he was at home, he suddenly had a heart attack. Well, that doesn't sound right to me. Because when you have a weak heart, you sh it should kind of give in when you're really, you know, putting it under strain. But instead, he was like, yay, let's get up to 1,400 meters while I'm struggling, you know, getting up there. And he did it all day long. He felt super fine, super energetic. And then when you're dressed, sitting a cup of, you know, sipping a cup of tea, that's when you have a heart attack. I don't think so. However, when you're inside the house and they Intel has put the dues around you, they will try to hit you when you're stationary, you know, when they really honed in on your heart. So I bring it up um, because also um, I think today Gerhard Ulrich is undergoing surgery. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm really hoping that he'll be, he'll be fine. But um, my thoughts are going out to him today. So I really want people to, um, to support him. And then, just sorry, I will pass the microphone back um, straight away. I just wanted to share my screen and show people one last thing about the, um, the website. Um, because one of the things, sorry, let me go back. Um, I tried to tidy it up a bit. And now under court cases, I have... Um, put all the court cases that are kind of important. So here's Philip Curvis MI5, my court case, <clears throat> Siegfried Thomas, and I'll put more and more information here, but this is Gerhard Ulrich. So for the people who don't know who I'm talking about, there's some information on him here and some interviews in German and English, and I'll be putting out more information. But um, yeah, I um, I think we, we have to kind of, what I was, the point I was trying to make is we have to, 
not just forget about incidences, but instead keep the data and then we can always go back in time and look at statistical or time correlations. And then I, I well, I, the, the one thing I want to say to people when they get really disheartened is that I, as a data analyst um, at CERN, uh, well, in particular, physics, I don't even know how many events we had in the data. I mean, we're talking not just terabytes, but many, many, many more. And um, out of 15 years of running of a high energy experiment with, I don't know how many quadrillion events, I picked out for my PhD thesis, I picked out, I think, 48 or something like that. Um, to measure a physical process uh, more or less precisely, as precisely as we could. Okay, so I know what you can do with proper statistics, not, not the statistics they quote in the newspapers, no proper scientific statistics, which is what we use for everything. That, that is such a powerful weapon. Uh, you, can, you can pick out anything. So using maths and statistics and bit of systems analysis, I am of the opinion we can find pretty much all the crimes that they've ever committed. If, we, if we're clever about it and have all the data we need, we can find it. So I, these people don't even know what they're in for because we now have the database tools, we have the, the software analysis tools, we've even got AI neural networks, you know, to comb through the, the data. We will find every single crime that they have ever committed. That's my opinion. You know, and yeah, I've I been think telling... that Go ahead, I'll let Karen. Oh, okay. Um, I have been telling people to watch, at least in the United States, when Trump came out with the executive order last tw uh, December, they talked about freezing and stripping the assets of people who are suspected of pedophilia and human trafficking. And they said, does or does that not apply to us? And uh, as I said on another program, uh, a friend of mine consulted a legal expert, and he said, this is a brilliant piece of uh, of uh, law because it it can open the door to going after the vast majority of people involved in this not only overseas but in the united states the only people that it doesn't cover are the feds and then later donald trump came up with a new directive that allows the heads of federal agencies more leeway to fire people i mean unless you portray that person as being mentally unstable it's very hard to fire a federal employee, okay? Well, because, you know, a lot of people like to do retaliation. So it, they've made it difficult to fire them unless you have really good cause. So, of course, a lot of these people have gone, they've jumped onto the, uh -oh, excuse me, the mental health wagon where they portray somebody as insane. So they are forced, unfortunately, to fire the person who just told on somebody. OK, so that has been uh, put into place so you can more easily fire the feds you couldn't hit with the executive order. And now there's been uh, a change to the National Guard duties. Basically, they are being given the authority to hire people to help them with military style tribunals hire people with legal knowledge, civilians, and they have uh, apparently been given the authority to potentially arrest um, crooked FBI, crooked fusion center, and civilians working for them. So as I told people before, watch for the puzzle pieces to start to form a noose around these people's necks. So you don't think the president Wasn't that knows? mean? I think he Wasn't knows. That mean? Wouldn't that mean cleaning out the entire FBI? You know what? Maybe it needs to be raised to the ground and started again. I think so. Bill Binney makes the point about Intel, and I think he's got a point. You need a new personnel bottom up, you know. But I think at the same time, we should recapture organizations and then, you know, find different systems of, you know. I mean, also Ray McGowan makes the point that uh, it was a, well, I think he calls it a design fault that you had all the secrecy in the CIA. I mean, it's a, a total design fault. So even if you populate it with honest people to start with, the system will go crooked by itself, by the natural laws. But actually- And it also, it's about the infiltrators spreading their kind like a virus through the system, right? Well, they hire their speaking, own kind. Yeah. They hire their own kind. Uh -huh. Yeah, I've been speaking with Gerald Sosby lately and he reports that in his estimation, it's the FBI and CIA, you know, who are the ultimate bad guys, the ultimate so-called deep state shadow government, whatever you have it. And they're sort of running rings around the NSA and the DEA and everybody 
everybody else, and they're kind of telling the DOJ what to do, what to do. So they're kind of running the show in a sense. Where, where so I have to podcast with General Sosby, by the way. We have to get yeah. him on air. I, I would love to. I would really love to. I just sent him an email the other day when I got his um, affidavit up on my website. Uh, you know, I yeah, we should get him because I want these people to come forward and keep talking and keep talking every single week like we do, you know. And, uh, and, and Absolutely. But, you know, we we are in a sense holding space for them. We're making space for them you know by having our platforms and having our podcasts and our shows so um i'm so glad we're doing what we're doing and actually it's encouragement when they speak to us and call us and communicate with us that you know we are on the right track and uh, we shouldn't stop what we are doing because in a sense we're supporting each other it's like the police whistleblower thing you know we're kind of all working in the same space where at this point i think all of us this show is is a reporting show it's a media show you know it's a media platform and I, I, so, I actually encourage the uh, police whistleblowers to get together. I mean, find like stable groups of, you know, Paul Marco said, you know, three to five people is perfect. You know, you can have little groups of up to 12, but beyond 12, forget it. But already 12 can be infiltrated and people just have, you know, mood swings and so on. So I think three to five is perfect. And I actually encourage people to imitate techno so that, you know, little mushrooms of these reporting groups jump up everywhere and start working and start reporting about their work every single week because, um, you know, as Karen said, um, a lot of the stuff will be revealed and we all have to be on the same page. And, and I'm saying that we need to cycle the systems also. When the, So uh, here in Europe, I'm, I'm telling everybody, you know, if the U.S. starts cycling, so Donald Trump starts cleaning stuff out, we can't be sitting in our hands over here because as soon as one system gets kind of, it's almost like when you're when you're you've got big, uh, I don't know, countries underwater, you know, water. Let's call it water. It's more like fecal matter, but anyway, um, when when one country gets raised out of this, you know, it's like rising up, the water or the shit pours over to all the other countries that are still down there. So you know, if the U.S. is tidying up the corruption. All the corrupt people will be starting to look for new markets or the, the slush funds will be slushing elsewhere. And sooner or later, they will end up here in Switzerland. You know, all the weapons will be coming over here, absolutely in Switzerland, Germany and, and so on. So I'm saying if we're cycling the system and we don't want this kind of like, you know, stuff sloshing left and right, we have to all start moving in lockstep, you know, so that these criminals have nowhere to go. So this this is actually before I forget, Ramola, I'm going to pass you the microphone, but I just want to show you one thing. And that's actually Ramola's achievement. So I didn't notice people because, you know, let me just take you back. So here's the um, I was writing the campaign page and one of the ca first campaigns ever um, was the, the memo to Trump, which Ramola wrote. OK, so this is her uh, idea and her initiative. And if you go, oh, hold on, we worked on the draft a little bit together, remember? So I think you had a lot of input to that draft too, and so did Karen. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, but you know, I think I just read through your draft, Ramola. I mean, no, she's being too too kind, you know. But no, 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 it was actually Ramola's draft. I have to say, it was a brilliant draft, and um, the actual memo is is here, the memo to Trump. But everybody knows about the executive orders, right? About um, the one against human trafficking and the property, blocking the property of persons involved in serious human rights abuse or corruption. And then also people heard about the um, uh, January having been declared by Donald Trump as the National Slavery and Human Trafficking Prevention Month. But it was only when I made this page that I discovered an interview that Donald Trump gave on the 23rd of February 2017. This was literally weeks after he got the memo all right. And that is Donald Trump saying, I'm just going to play 30 seconds of this, him talking about um, human trafficking and how he will fight the human trafficking epidemic. Literally weeks after the memo. Listen to this. Hang on. I want to make it clear today that my administration will focus on ending the absolutely horrific practice of human trafficking. And I am prepared to bring the full force and weight of our government to the federal and at the federal level and the other highest levels that we can do in order to solve this horrific problem getting worse and it's happening in the united states in addition to the rest of the world but it's happening in the united states which is terrible 
Human trafficking is a dire problem, both domestically and internationally, and is one that's made a really uh, a challenge, and it's really made possible to a large extent uh, more of a modern phenomenon by what's taking place on the internet, as you probably know. Solving the human trafficking epidemic, which is what it is, is a priority for my administration. We're going to help out a lot. Solve is a wonderful word, a beautiful word, but I can tell you it's going to help a lot. So that's all I wanted to play. But basically, I discovered that um, Donald Trump was saying all that did she weeks after getting your memo ramola and I, i'm really i'm of the opinion that it's thanks to you that it actually became one of the top priorities of the of the administration oh catherine i i do hope that the memo did have an effect but you know the memo became powerful because so many of us signed it around the world and around the country you know so i do think and so many people have been sending and tweeting and you know emailing that memo over and over and over again and i think it is a very important document just as karen's document about the silent holocaust her statement there is very very important and her petition to take people off the enemies list and you know your statement about the whole thing being a global Nazi extermination program. I think all of these documents are very, very important. However, I have noticed looking at the the write up, you know, in that um, uh, in that executive order, and also in recent news reports about this human trafficking, that nothing is being said about the human trafficking of civilians, of citizens by the fusion centers, by the intelligence agencies, which is really what we are talking about. We are talking about the local FBI, the DHS, and the domestic arm of the CIA trafficking people who are first wrongfully named necessary to be surveilled. You know, they are named putative or potential terrorists or extremists. They get their names on the list as Put a public analytics and they're recording it, you know, but they're certainly recording it in their trunk, as Karen said. They're putting it in files and sticking it in the trunk. Yeah, you had a comment? Karen. No, 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 no. I just wanted you to say the last two sentences because on my end, they garbled you. When you started talking about the fusion centers being involved, they started truncating it, and then eventually they said, you, I heard you say like eight sentences in like two seconds. Like, Dude, it's eight. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Okay, I'm happy to I'm happy to replay that for those guys who are recording my every word with such bated breath over there. So basically, what I'm talking about is what uh, President Donald Trump has not taken into account is the human trafficking of citizens and civilians within our various countries by the local agencies, the local intelligence agencies. And in the case of the U.S., we are talking about the FBI. We are talking about the fusion centers. We are talking about the local, the domestic arm of the CIA wrongfully putting people under surveillance, naming them wrongfully putative or potential terrorists and potential extremists, rolling them into these secret lists, which I wonder if they're even being kept in an official or legal way in an official or legal database, but are rather being rolled into files and stuck in trunks, as Karen brought, for, brought forward to us. You know, She actually made the discovery that when she talked to a police officer or was it a sheriff's, sheriff's deputy, he went to the trunk of his car and flipped it open and looked at a bunch of folders over there and said, oh, yeah, you're on that list or whatever. So, um, you know, that's something we should hold before us. Sorry, Karen, go right yeah. ahead. You can, no, yeah. he actually just said, oh, mm, okay, well, we can't help you. And then put it back in the trunk. <laughs> right, we can't help you, you see, and that is the primary aspect. Your constitutional rights don't exist. You have no rights to due process. You're a non-entity. You're a non-person. You know, because you are on this private secret list that we have determined means we are not going to give you any due process. We are going to human traffic you into a dirty black ops military experiment or a dirty black ops CIA experiment, whereby you become fodder for terminal experimentation. And these guys can, you know, put deadly, horrific electromagnetic energy through these ghastly neuroweapons into your brain, into your many organs, and finish you off. You are a terminal experimentee. You have no rights. You are being human trafficked. So this is the human trafficking that is the most egregious human trafficking of them all, because you know what? It includes children. It does. Donald Trump is supposedly very, very concerned about the children being trafficked in this country, being abused, you know? And these are children across the races. These are white children, black children, brown children, Asian children. They're children across every 
every denomination and demographic. So if Donald Trump really cares about the children, he should understand that children are now being given, as you pointed out earlier, Catherine, they're even being given cancer. They are being given all manner of ghastly diseases by the use of these electromagnetic weapons on their bodies. Also through the use of the electromagnetic weapons, etc. So by military, non-consensual military experimentation, non-consensual MK Ultra style CIA experimentation has been affected. And who is to blame? Your local fusion center is to blame, the local FBI informant is to blame, and the local FBI is to blame for putting thousands of innocent people into these programs, into these ghastly brain programs. This is the rampant scandals of the day. And this has to be openly spoken about. And this has to be brought to Donald Trump's attention. Maybe, Catherine, maybe. Just I think the, out, the audio was really Yeah, we lost her. Her. The last three. Are you still there, Ramola? Can you say the last two sentences? Because I'm still here. I'm still here. I do cut off. Yes, um, give us the last two sentences. Okay, the last okay. two sentences were Fusion basically sentence. okay. The last two, I said, who is to blame? Oh boy, the local FBI is to blame. The local FBI informants are to blame. Me off again. I, you know what they they didn't like the fact when he started talking about uh, cancer being given to children with direct energy weapons. Ah, it became difficult. So I think that. You hit the target. Okay, that has to be the subject of the next memo then. You know, that's what I was saying. I was saying maybe we need to write a second memo to Donald Trump to point out to him that this is human trafficking into military and intelligence experimentation. You know what? Actually, one of the things that I found super powerful, and I hope that people keep, uh, keep it up, um, the, the veterans, Veteran Intelligence Professionals for Sanity, the VIPs, they just didn't just put out one memo to Trump or they put out regular memos. And I love that. Actually, they put out one about Iran and how Iran isn't such a big deal, which is actually helping to avoid World War III as far as I can tell. But I love the entire concept because what we're having is that, um, sorry, I guess, um, so what, what, we, what these people achieved is that they are all intelligence professionals. They've got all their professional credentials, their years of experience, right? They stepped out of these corrupt systems. They regrouped. They're putting their own analysis like before at work, but now they're making it public. And it's not just that, oh, you know, an intelligence report that's then under the table and classified and then passed on to, you know, people. But it's put out there for everybody to read and download. And that is worth gold, actually, you know? So I'm thinking every single person who has been ejected out of a system, you know, should regroup outside with like-minded people of equal caliber or, you know, integrity, and let's start putting it out from outside the systems. You know, I don't think that science should be done inside the universities. You know, I have fallen out of all the clouds, you know. Um, and and I think what, what I would say is that, um, you know, we shouldn't just put out one memo. We should put, actually, we, we, one of the things that we are writing in the background, guys, is the JIT reports, right? So we should start putting those out and JIT reports about these crimes. And um, the, I, I encourage the police officers in the uh, UK and elsewhere to start putting out police reports, you know, like they would, but not, you know, not like they used to, where it was just filed away somewhere and forgotten about, but put it out to the public, you know, like they should have done all along. So we should all put out memos continuously. We can address it to Trump, to other other heads of state has to be addressed as well. And we should do it on a continuous basis, I think. Very good point. I totally agree with that, Catherine. And, you know, in fact, if you recall, I did a notice of crimes against humanity 
And in that, I very clearly stated that the militaries of the world, the intelligence agencies of the world are engaging in massive violations of human rights. You know, massive abuses are going on. And that particular document, I just noticed this last night, I have to fix this, but I noticed it last night, it's being messed with. Somebody is sneaking into my WordPress um, you know, site in the back end and fixing it such that that particular document is not being spread out. Because I'm coming right out and saying the military is an intelligence intelligence agencies are assaulting their populaces, which of course we all are saying in many different ways, but you put it in a document like that, which says notice of crimes against humanity, I think it is powerful. So I think there are some of our documents that are particularly powerful that we need to sort of keep in front of the public eye. You know, we need to find a means of the guy, I don't really know how, but I think your attitude of uh, continuing the memos and doing a series of memos is a brilliant idea. I was actually thinking at one point, you know, shall I write a letter to Donald Trump a day? And, you know, and then I thought, oh, God, I don't have the time to do that. So, you know, if I wrote 365 letters a day, I think any one of us doing that, you'd certainly get some attention if you did that. Um, but 365 may be a bit too much for me, but, you know, we can do it in some kind of regular way. Maybe we should, you know, put our heads together and figure out a good schedule and just do it. Maybe we can take it in turns and that might sort of, you know, spread the work a little bit and we can get it done. Well, I would say in regard to seeing some changes, I just saw on, um, I think it was on several YouTubes where Christine, I think it's Macy, who actually started the SES or the, um, oh, geez, I think I just lost the name of it, um, Senior Executive Service um, status in the 1970s, maybe 1979. And those are the people who get really high up there and they're usually called flag badgers because they've made it so high that they get their prestigious pictures taken with the American flag in the background. Well, she basically has been uh, linked with Hillary Clinton and human trafficking. So the SES, people are starting to call for the SES to be abolished because it looks like a lot of crime has been committed by these high executives. And when I was at NSA, we always said, what are we doing with all these managers? Because we've, we've got like five Indians and 112 chiefs. You know, the five Indians are doing all the work, you know, and the chiefs are just doing nothing. You know, they're coming around and looking at your work. And well, the, Indians, the Indians are mostly women, right? And then the chiefs are mostly men? <laughs> pretty much. Pretty much. And... Uh, I said that the way NSA worked, I would not be proud to be up real high at NSA because that probably means you compromise yourself to get there. But anyway, so I'm taking it as uh, yet another good uh, step forward that people are calling for the abolishment of the SES. And I think that's not a bad idea. I, you know what, the SES, uh, I knew absolutely nothing about the existence of that. But when I, when I heard it, I, I wasn't too surprised because I'm still looking. I'm, I'm kind of I not having all the data and the intelligence. Uh, I just go with systems analysis and I look for what's missing. And then I wait for when are the missing puzzle pieces coming into the corners where I'm still missing data. And um, one of the things that I'm trying to build is this bridge. So I, uh, people fall into the trap when they don't come from the systems analysis point of view, they fall into the trap of thinking, oh, this corruption started with Operation Paperclip. It started, I don't know what, in the 70s or the 40s or the 50s or at the end of the 19th century. And that's not true. Deep capture in the US started in the 15th century with the very first settlers. And that's because as soon as you had a ship go over there, what, that's when you had the first load of the Vatican Intelligence Agency agents and infiltrators being offloaded into America. So the entire intelligence business, I mean, it's the second oldest profession, right? This entire spying business, I'm very too And unreal. very closely related to the first. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and, um, and the one that is, was there first was the, the church. I mean, you know, you have a church, you've got the freaking church, you know, a little franchise, like a little church McDonald's in every single town around the world, you know, of one shape or another. This means that religion and the church as a system was there first. So that's why the Vatican Intelligence Agency is the biggest and most powerful that there is. But we forgot about it because that's the one never spoken of. We all know about MI6, the CIA, the KGB and so on, and Chinese intel. But no one talks about the Vatican Intelligence Agency. 
because it, and they are the oldest and that's why they must be the biggest and that's why they must also be the most corrupt and the most psychopathic and the most child trafficking by the way but uh no one talks about it and that's how secret they are so when you think about it like that it's pretty clear that from day one of settling the us you already had a boatload of vatican intelligence agencies there so that's how it was built up so intelligence was around in babylonian times and so on so these are the systems that are still with us so now when people talking about deep capture of nsa and cia and they're wondering deep capture by whom i can tell you by whom by the system that was there from the beginning and helped to set them up and still controls the corruption from from the top and that's how it all ties together that's why the inland revenue tax money gets paid to the city of london and then sloshes on into the vatican bank and so on so there's a little round circle but all roads lead to rome you know this saying comes from the fact that whichever direction you use if you investigate organized crime if you look where your money is going you know your politics your political decisions it all leads to rome still does but from this this is the systems analysis point of view so okay and now i'm i'm thinking right i know that the vatican intelligence agency must be there it's global where is it where are the where are the the hints for it and i think the senior executive service is exactly this link um, in other words for me these people they are not american intelligence agents because they are not acting in the interests of the americans they are answerable to another system to a foreign system which by the way also makes it high treason if you get caught you know so in for the death penalty you know in for a penny in for a pound as we say so <laughs> these people can right be fast tracked you know in the uh in the so. in, in the court marshals but um i actually think people should start thinking about it in these terms like where are the tentacles to old europe you know where are the intel tentacles the financial tentacles to old, old europe and finance they already found it so all the inland revenue um money goes straight abroad you don't get a penny so the government always takes a new loan to pay for the government officials that's the reality you know and all the taxpayer money already goes straight away abroad you know that's how the system is set up um but now this, the, if the senior executive service has ties to the Vatican intelligence agency you are expecting ties to to through that to everything to Mossad to German intel to MI6 to the KGB because that's basically the, the spider you know at the top oh by the way if i if if i find it i might have i i might get evidence for just what i said so just keep with me you know i'll just I'll that's something. okay i was just looking at the chat actually and people were having a conversation about something or the other and somebody seemed to say that um just want to say to the people on chat, if you're talking about me and, you know, somebody's stepbrother, I just put a little note there to ask Donna S. if she means me when she said her stepbrother. Uh, I don't have a stepbrother. She said her stepbrother spoke about her on the, on the Jason Goodman show. I hope not, uh, because that would mean some kind of impersonation going on because um, I don't have a stepbrother. So I hope that's not in reference to me. I don't Just making it. a statement. Oh, good. Yeah, let's just clarify that none of us have stepbrothers. <laughs> so I don't know anything about the Jason Jason Goodman show, but uh, but you know, I haven't been on it. <laughs> but um, anyway, so um, there there is another subject I wanted to raise, but I know Catherine's right in the middle of finding something. Are you looking for something, Catherine? Oops. Sorry, I, I think it's not urgent. I can, I can, you know, people, I, I can send people off with the homework and say, look for the Vatican, look for, you know, hints that there's a Vatican intelligence agency that controls MI6 and the CIA. And then maybe next week I can find a link. Um, mm -hmm. But let's move on because there's so much stuff. Oh, I think this, this Pope is coming down. Oh, yeah. I really do. Oh, I hope so. <laughs> I think the Vatican is... He's at the top of that pyramid, isn't he? Yeah, I think... I think yeah. Once Trump has finished cleansing the United States, it is going to have a ripple effect. Just like you said, you can't have one nation operating on the up and up, and the other ones are mired in the same old garbage that they've been mired in. Because the Germans, the British, the French are going to say, they did it, why can't we? Exactly. You know? Exactly. I'm so glad you say that because next week I will start actually tomorrow. I'll send a bunch of letters 
in my own case here in Switzerland. And I've last year, actually it was almost the anniversary. So on the 15th of March, 2017, I went personally to the military HQ in Bern and I spoke with a guy who he, he was stupid enough himself to admit that he was a senior intelligence agent of the NDB, the Nachrichtendienst des Bundes. So I was like, oh boy, you know, <laughs> we've got ways to make you talk, you know, I thought, great. So he told me the jackass, um, which means that I have already handed in my case to the fifth, on the 15th of March to the NDB and the senior guy at that, who himself said he really knows what's going on. So. It means that from that day onward, the NDB is liable to all the um, everything that they did to me because I, you know, I can prove that they knew about it. But anyway, I actually am going to write to them again, and I have now gave, given them one year, and now I'm going to take them by the their soft parts, and I'm going to say, okay, now let's talk legal, um, and I'm going to, you know, list all this. But one of the points I want to make is exactly this, and I hopefully the Swiss are, you know, have the business thinking to think, hang on, if, if the US is cycling out and is moving to a new model, then we have to move as well. We need to clear out the corruption because um, you know, at the end of the day, I can give people one hint if they're looking for the Vatican intelligence agency, it's here, <laughs> the HQ is here. <laughs> That's why the red and white of the cross you know, is everywhere because it's here, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, interestingly, over the weekend, I was um, I was do doing the first edition of a sh new show called Hyper Truths. Um, you know, you may have seen a little bit about it on Twitter with um, Dr. Stuart Swerdlow, you know, who's the Montauk Project whistleblower and, you know, a lot of whistleblower, but a lot of other things. One of the things that he says, because his assessment about what's going on, etc., is that there's a lot of infighting at the very top, you know, with the Illuminati and the Fourth Reich which as we know is all over this country. So uh, <laughs> so it should be interesting to see how it all goes down and um, how many popes and generals and presidents get taken down, right, in the days to come. Actually, if, yeah, people, let's just... if people are curious about uh, um, a music video that actually talks about this battle, they should, uh, they should uh, watch, what's it called, Kesha Blow? I think the music video by Kesha called Blow is exactly about the battle of these frankly mafiosi. So you can see the, uh, you know, the, the, the Vanderbilt family, you know, fighting, uh, you know, with the, the all seeing eye pyramid thing, you know, representing the crime cartel and so on and so on. Yeah, well, let's all just buy popcorn and see how they annihilate each other. Well, you know, um, if you believe in uh, modern day prophecy, if you don't, you can blow this off. But um, Mark Taylor is somebody that I, I do pay attention to, and he's saying that there's more to come, that we're going to lose about three Supreme Court justices to being indicted and taken off the court, three, okay, likely having to do with corruption and child trafficking, et cetera, et cetera. And he's, he's predicted that uh, two to three of the past presidents will go to prison for treason. Now, of course, a couple of the, we've got five. As but, well they should, you know, given 9-11. Yes. Oh, gosh, yes, yes. Um, two, of course, are so elderly that they're going to die. That's very likely Bush Sr. and uh, Jimmy Carter. But the other three are up for being put away in prison. So we shall see. By the way, by the way, the, the Supreme Court <laughs> are discounting Lord Jonathan Sumption, who was involved in my human trafficking, or can I add him to the list? <laughs> well, let's ask Mark. We'll get in touch with Mark. <laughs> but I found it very interesting because um, so many people have prayed Second uh, Chronicles 7.14, which basically says if my people will uh, basically um, turn from their evil, from being, you know, and, and I'm saying Christians basically have let things go to pot. You know, we've not said you know this is our inheritance we are a moral people you know we have grown to tolerate 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 evil and when you tolerate evil to such an extent evil silence is good at a certain point because it's reached that point of power and that's where we are because there are so many people who contact me and say i think i was targeted because i told the truth i spoke out you know, basically told, you know, spoke um, truth to power. And when you're in a nation that punishes and destroys your life,
for speaking truth, you better change that nation around. You better turn it around. And a lot of people would leave this country, except there's nowhere to go. It has gotten to the point there is nowhere to go in the world that is not just as corrupt. So this is the time to do something or we've, we're sunk. But I do think personally that the prayers using the Second Corinthians 7.14 um, which say, if my people would basically repent and turn to me, that I will heal their land. Okay? I think that is the operational um, verse that is being prayed and we are getting a response to. Because that was told to the Israelites eons ago, and it still applies. And there were people who recognized that the evil was basically taking off, and people were oblivious to it. They weren't recognizing it for evil. And so there are many, many people who have been praying for this intervention, and I think we're seeing it. So that's my personal belief. You know, I'm not pushing it on anybody, but I'm just saying this is what I think. I think we're seeing it. I think people need to take hope because things are happening behind the scenes that would not be humanly possible to happen. So hang in. Yes, and I would say can prayer and meditation is always powerful, you know, and can sort of bring in, one hopes, other kinds of power and energy into the mix. Um, I would also say, because you just made the point that, you know, people would love to leave the U.S., but they can't because this is the country, etc. cetera. Um, and, you know, think about it. A lot of the corruption is emanating from here. It's stemming from here. I'm not saying it's not, you know, coming from Switzerland or London or whatever, but... It's coming from a lot of, you know, quarters, apparently. But a lot of it is sort of emanating from here and originating from here, isn't it, Karen? It so is, unfortunately. Given, yeah, so given that, I would just say to pretty much every American, come on, you know, do something. Get off your butt and do something, please, whatever it is. I don't know what it is. I don't know what kind of sphere of influence you may have, what kind of networks you may have, who you are etc. But it, it's not the time to sit back and do nothing. It's time to kind of show yourself, show who you are and do something. You know, if you have integrity, show the, show the world you have some integrity. If you don't, you know, then it's going to quickly come out that you don't. Because I think the uh, things are coming out. Things are actually being exposed in rapid ways uh, I these days. From what I think you said it right, exactly the, um, you know, um, the right thing because I think people underestimate how powerful they actually are. And one of the things that make people extremely powerful are their networks. How many you know, people do you know? How many people can you influence? And uh, that's one of the reasons why I um, emphasized the memo to Trump today, because, um, hey, none of us had a connection to Trump, yet, you know, Ramola and her campaign really managed to influence Trump. I'm really, I really am convinced of that. You know, I really think he read the memo. And I really think that it kicks off something absolutely big. And I also remember that the, the Secret Service was trying to find out how you got the memo to Trump or something. They were calling you. and Well, I, well, I, I guess our version of the Secret Service, right, who show up as, you know, our email buddies and our Facebook buddies and our uh, so forth Twitter buddies. And they send us little notes saying, what fax number did you use? Please let me know. And it's like, excuse me, why would I share this information with you? And why are you so concerned? But so frankly, we want to find out who you know got it past our shields, you know. We yeah, are the secret Robert service. We are the secret service, and we suspect you of being a patriot. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, <it's> highly dangerous <laughs> to our mission. We are. We've already overthrown the country, and we want to know what you're doing in the middle of it. You know, pretending to uh, try to save it. Gosh, you know. Talking about saving the country, one of the things that I um I wanted to share that I just discovered last week is um this website called deagle.com. And I was sharing something. So um hang on, let me find my tweets. Or maybe I can't find my tweets. But um let me show you this website because I'm talking about saving a country. Um if you go to uh www.deagel.com. Okay, this news has, uh, this site has got news about defense contracts, who buys what, um, you know, across countries and so on. And in the search, you can type things like uh, United States. And then it first looks like you don't get a result. Um, hang on, it just takes some time. Um, yeah, and it says, sorry, no matches found. But then if you click on country, because now it's searching under equipment, 
you've got country equipment news orders and photos if you click on the tab country it does find the united states and it has all this information on the united states but one of the things i find worrying is that it has for the year 2016 a population oops sorry of 324 million but then it does a forecast for 2025 where the population is 54 million or perhaps they mean 54 million down but it doesn't really make sense because here if the um you know if the world figures are 7.3 billion surely it, the world um you know uh the world number is not going to go down by 6.8 billion so i really think that this, they do mean the flat number of 58 million which means that i don't know this website that seems to be massively clued in about weapons technology seems to predict that the u.s the size of the u.s the population is being decimated within the next seven years by 83 percent or something yes like that. yes and this is something Deborah Tavares has, you know, brought attention to. Various people on the web have been bringing attention to for quite some time. It's all connected with this Agenda 21 2030 plan. It's the genocide plan. And if you notice, if you go through that particular Daigle page, you will notice that they are expecting such a dramatic cut in population all across the West, all across Europe, all across the US, particularly the, the highest amount, I think, is in the US. Uh, less so, by the way, in India and China, because if you look at the figures and the percentages, you will see, because I've looked at this a little while ago, um, you know, the, the, the reductions are less, the, the projected reductions are less for the Asian countries, particularly the most populous countries, that's India and China. So it's heavily skewed towards taking out Americans. And we all know why they want to take out Americans and why they want to take out people in the West. You know, this is a very, these are wealthy industrialized nations with very high degrees of education, where you have a very large middle class population, right? That's well educated and well aware and intellectual and intelligent. And perhaps Perhaps this also explains why this part of the world, the US and Europe in particular, are being so heavily attacked with electromagnetic weapons and with mind control technology and with such an um, set up grid, you know, an entrenched control grid. So literally this has connections to the entire Tavistock enterprise the uh, Rand Corporation Enterprise. If you listen to Deborah Ta Tavares's uh, research, you know, she talks about a memo called uh, on the restructuring of North, of North America. They're planning to restructure North America, They'll break it up into regions and all under the guise of, you know, organizing the people around the big old boogaboo of global warming, climate change, you know, horrific climate things are going to happen. Oh, excuse me while I go and, you know, activate my little background. No, you didn't see that. Uh, here's a tornado. Here's Hurricane Maria. And, you know, we're going to wipe out Puerto Rico. <laughs> and Agenda 2030, you know, so that's what's going on, right? It's the Wizard of Oz. So, um, that this is what's going on. And this actually is something for all of us to keep in mind. So even if we see the Pope being taken down or, the, or a couple of presidents being taken down, we have to be aware that these guys have had this agenda ticking away for decades, for centuries. You know? Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I was going to point out very quickly, um, I'm sitting here in Maryland and we have several inches of yeah. snow on we the ground. still have a lot of work to do alerting the Are you having a bomb cyclone, perhaps? No, we had ha some we have several inches of snow. Yeah, and I uh, I went out yesterday, and uh, I said, "Gosh, if the world gets any any warmer, we're going to freeze to death." <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's not good, though. <laughs> yeah, this is totally well, unnatural know. for Maryland in in late April. I mean, late March. Yes, absolutely. I know. I used to live in the DC area. I know. <laughs> it's kind of strange. <laughs> but of course, here in the Boston area, it's not so strange. They actually made up a big old storm that was supposed to kind of wipe out um, time and space last night, but it didn't really happen. <laughs> today, we got like two or three inches of snow. And, you know, they'd closed the schools, early release and everything yesterday. Nothing major happened. And this morning, there was snow, but the schools stayed open. The schools decided not to listen to the weather, guys, I guess. <laughs> Right. So, but you know, that's, the, they'd like to take credit for anything that happens, whether they're able to pull it off or they're not able to pull it off, they're going to they're gonna try to credit for it and call it climate change and call it global warming. 
you know and um and they're trying to kind of pull put pull people around that everything the wildlands read you know the map the wildlands if you've all seen that they're expecting to break up the country into pockets of high urban living you know stack and pack cities and all around them we have corridors you know for what the the jaguars and the panthers that live here <laughs> i don't know what they're talking about frogs. so i mean <laughs> the frogs right well we're all for frogs we're all for birds and jaguars and so forth but frankly you know do we really need to break up the entire country this way so no it's a control mechanism i mean the head of what is it um one of the biggest uh ecological groups was saying that uh many years ago pretty much the new new world order people moved in to take it over as a means to control people i mean those are the ones who are pushing her pushing legislation that tell you it's illegal to collect rainwater that is just unbelievable. Or it's illegal for you to have a pond on your uh, on your property. That's none of anybody's business. So it's exactly. a control mechanism. It is. It is also connected to you know you can't grow vegetables in your yards and you know things like that. And now, did you see HS? You know the New World Order, of course, knows no boundaries. And NHS in Britain recently put a hold on any kind of homeopathic medicine or herbal medicine. You know, so people are forbidden from using those things. It's absolutely unbelievable. That's absolute tyranny. That's totalitarianism. And we know the New World Order is all about that. Right. So, um, you know, it's it's like people have to come forward. If people, this is why everybody has to wake up and find out what's going on. And that Daigle site that you pointed to, Catherine, is a very important part of it. You know, the Georgia Guidestones is another big part of it. The Georgia Guidestones, when it first came on the map and people started speaking about it, it sounded like such nonsense right i mean nobody could believe that this could possibly be true but somebody had taken the trouble to actually get this huge amount of stone and stick it in the middle of nowhere and inscribe it with these so-called goals and there are all sorts of horrendous goals about you know depopulation and taking over and then you know couched in very friendly language like we are all have to live in home. Oh, oh, the NVO did not like your statements, Ramola. Your audio quality went from excellent to non existent. Yeah, you were saying the Georgia Guidestones were basically uh, using uh, euphemistic language to say we're basically going to uh, clear out humanity so that frogs and uh, and birds can have the world to themselves, which I love nature. And I think anybody who isn't careful ecologically is a fool, you know. Um, but this is being used to say hum humans can't live here anymore. I'm sorry, you're too destructive. Well, that's ludicrous. You know, that's ludicrous. We're going to take this entire town and, and uh, put you in a gas chamber because the frogs need to move freely. That's, you know, that's garbage. That's absolute lunacy and garbage, you know. And I think, you know, we put our finger right on the issue. Because and it's, it's a lie. It's to cover up, you know. That yeah. It, it is it's for the greater good. <laughs> and the other word we should watch for, because they took, I, I think it, it actually works the other way around. We have psychopaths at the top who most of the time just want to kill people because that's how they get off and how they signal to each other how sick they are to hold on to their power and then they need to have a bigger and bigger shows of mass killing to keep the other psychopaths at bay so that's what it starts off with and then they try to use different justifications for mass killing oh it's either oh we have to you know kill a million over a million people because we, we are going into iraq or syria or africa or this or that and now if they want to annihilate the, um, you know, the Americans, they have to come up with a cover story and global warming and hurricanes and you know what, uh, forest fires that somehow don't burn the trees but burn every single house in California, you know, and stuff like that are wonderful excuses. But once these people settle settle on a certain genocide agenda, they also uh, come out with a double speak language. And I think one word we should watch for is sustainability. Because I think with oh, sustainability, yeah. they mean genocide. And the, the sequence is, oh, humans are killing the planet. 
That's why we need to kill off some humans to be sustainable. So to be sustainable, we need to kill off a couple of humans. So every single time that you have these Bilderbergers and I don't know what these, you know, the Council for Foreign Relations and all these people talk about sustainability and all this program is to achieve sustainability, what they actually mean is, oh, this program is for the genocide, for the planned genocide. And Correct. I that, is, that is a term definitely that completely is a trademark of what they are doing. The word sustainability should, you know, ring alarm bells in everybody's mind. But I have to tell you that that word is now in 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 public language. It's in like the legislation. It's it's in the strategy documents. It's in the protocols. It's in it's on the websites. Okay, it's sustainable this, that and the other. And it, there are there are several other words. One of them is smart and the other is resilient or resilience. So now, Boston, for instance, is a part of the Resilient Cities Network. It's one of 100 resilient cities. And you know why they're so resilient? They're resilient because when the weather weapons hit them, they're going to have a set of protocols to help them, you know, handle the, the horrors of the weather weapons, which we are going to call climate change, you see. So, um, and th that resilience, I suspect, is going to be along the lines of how to get the National Guard out, how to get people used to seeing the tango streets and you know the old martial law and overt aspects of city takeover and slowly start moving people out you know from the exurbs and the suburbs into the cities so um that's how the city becomes resilient so step by step they are trying to move toward this horrific dystopian vision that they've got going over here you know they want to stack and pack people in cities and completely surround them with this electronic grid electromagnetic grid, I should say, and make sure that they can, you know, fry your brain to death, keep you compliant, fill you up with fluoride, finish off your pineal gland, finish off any um, attempted independence you might have. Oh, and by the way, I wanted to mention that one of the reasons America is targeted is also because it has traditionally been a very independent place. People are, have been traditionally thought to be independent, traditionally thought to have freedom of speech, traditional freedom of the Second Amendment. You have a bunch of people out there who, who think that they can stand up for themselves and um, be self-sufficient. and Make their own decisions, go live on the land, themselves. get off grid, and it's not acceptable and to so the And so America order. is being... Oh, oh, Ramola puts it to be on. an individual. Or... Yeah, Ramola. And so, you know... Am I in my audio? Your audio got obliterated. And I think you, you hit it again. <laughs> it's like every single time you're taken off. It's just, uh, actually, ladies, one of the things that I discovered is that um, sometimes sentences that we spoke and on the show were fine. And sometimes I would watch a certain passage in the, in the techno forum and it was audibly fine. I would go back and find something four weeks later and find certain sentences muted by YouTube certain passages of our speech are muted so we have to go back through all the techno forum and if i find any of those i mean i already sent a letter to youtube and i said look i'm you know pulling you into court action if you're not careful but that sort of um censorship we should really watch for because the audio was there and then the audio disappeared so um we all have to download these videos as quickly as possible and then make backup copies so that we can restore the audio of what we said you know but here it's uh, you just you just hit the nail on the um, you just hit the you know hit the nail with this entire thing because it's exactly what they are going to do. Um, sorry, I actually forgot what I wanted to yeah. say. <laughs> well, we were just talking about Americans, you know, being independent oh, okay. and uh, so forth, and how they're coming down on Americans. So. And I, the one thing I wanted to say to what Karen said, you know, they, uh, Karen, you said that the the Americans and also Ramola that the Americans are traditionally think independently. And you know, go out and live um, live off the land independently. Yes, and also traditionally, it was the Americans who were fleeing the Masonic networks of old Europe, and that's why they emigrated to America. Do you guys hear this melody? At what was that? I want. To, I've been hearing yeah, all sorts of weird interference. That was my phone. Sorry about that. I tried to oh, turn okay, it off okay. and it, it turned itself phone. back on. Not oh, yes. a siren, but it sounded like the, the horn. I was like, oh, wow, did I hit the jackpot? <laughs> you know, the old Masonic network is on Europe. Is that like a keyword, you know? 
was perfect. Yeah, time. I'm company from the Masonic Grand Lodge is keeping terms. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, no, but anyway, I mean, the American you're right. psyche, I guess, right. the, the independence, you know, the thought of independence, it's toxic to the New World Order. That's why they want any and all Americans basically sub, uh, subdued or eradicated, because they don't want that idea of independence to spread through people they want to subjugate. And that's black and white Americans, and most especially and you, black, because they basically came and told American society, you're claiming all this, but where's our freedom? We want it now. And so they're especially afraid, I think, of, of the blacks, because they'll take it. They'll say, we deserve it. We know we do. And you're not taking it from us. As where, you know, white America has gotten rather complacent, but we still have the idea of what founded this country. But so they're afraid of black and white America, you know, especially because we're, we have this toxic uh, to them uh, idea base, you know, and we're right. That's what humans are. We're independent. We need to decide our own fate, you know, and the government is here to protect us from foreigners coming over and trying to subjugate us. You know, that's what the government's supposed to be. But of course, after a couple hundred years, any and all free countries or free societies do fall uh, to predators within. So there's always a struggle and we either lose it or we recapture it and uh, exist for a few more years, you know. I would also say that this is now the first time the world is actually fighting for freedom because um, one of the things that has been covered up and kept from the Americans is that they never were born free. So by the time the, uh, the first settlers arrived in uh, in America, it was already carved up by the uh, British monarch and the Vatican. Sorry, I'm just getting so much feedback. Um, sorry, and, and the, the, uh, the what happened is that um, I think it was I don't know George the Third or one of these, and there's this contract that you know gives uh, entire states to him and the revenue um, of the states to them. And um, and the point I'm trying to make is that no country has ever been free there were just um countries or you know herds of cattle this is what we are in their eyes that were kept in in sometimes better farms under a better illusion of freedom but by the time any one of us now alive has been born or most of the people alive have been born um the currency system had already been corrupted uh, the inland revenue money was already going to the British crown, which, as I keep reminding people, is separate from the royal family, the crown being the crown corporation, as in the Vatican front in the city of London. So, you know, I think what we're actually in right now in 2018 is for uh, the world population, the, the first ever and the final, hopefully, fight all out against the, the organized crime cartel that has been ruling over us since probably the people say since the last ice age you know um and and then i think this is what it's about this is the this is the first ever world war that's not staged you know this is real so uh this is not a drill that's an excellent point actually although i have to say if you look at the military documents they anticipated this they anticipated urban warfare. They anticipated activists. You know why? Because they were going to roll. They knew, you know, the Tavistock guys who were who are actually dictating strategy to the military guys who were then creating the documents. They knew to be doing so something so dastardly and so ghastly to people that people were inevitably going to protest, you know. And so it would be, so this is how they, you know, come up with the definitions of the enemy combatant and new forms of guerrilla warfare and how the DOD has got to be so brilliant and, you know, be prepared for any eventuality, et cetera, et cetera. So in a sense, they're projecting. This is all predictive in a sense, you know, they set it up. They fight the torture and, you know, roll out these fascist programs on people. They expect pushback, they expect resistance, they expect activism you know, such as they are currently being faced with. And then they've got a technique for that as well. And their techniques and strategies, by the way, do, I think, involve electromagnetic weapons. So, you know, so perhaps this moment in history has been all written out in their little scrolls already. But I would I would say that that they that the 
thing that they see is the extent to which the public would rise up and the extent to which the internet would connect the world, right? And the extent to which people would become such a strong and effective resistance that their own reign would crumble. And I, and I would say that that is exactly what we are beginning to see in action and what I hope continues, you know, because I think we've got a long way to go because I think this agenda 2030 and all of that Tavistock business is very entrenched. You know, the Zionist Rothschild business, those guys, what they're doing, they're very entrenched. They have great power. They have great wealth. They have incredible technology. So they have a lot of power. The power we have, the power of our, you know, spiritual power, as Karen said, I really think it does and 50% God. Oh my god, today you're, you're literally just you know setting forth the wisdom of the universe because as soon as you say anything important, they're just like oh, quick, quick, mute, 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 and your your entire audio I think gets delayed so that they can listen to it first and then decide if they're gonna release it or just garble it completely. So when you said the sentence and the power that we have is it just went and then rah, rah, rah. <laughs> Where, where did I said what? And the Tell us again, what is the power that we have, Ramola? What is the power that the people oh the power have? that we have? Okay, well I think we've talked about it today. You know, the power that we have is the power of 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 numbers, the power of our thinking, the power of our feeling, the power of our responding as humans to what is going on. You know, just our own integrity, our own conscience, just responding as ourselves, as our individual independent selves, which we continue to be, despite whatever they try to do to stop it, right? And also the spiritual power that we have access to. And um, I was just closing by saying, if it is 50% us and 50% God, it's like, we do need to do our bit, but you know, we need, you know, other powers the universe, you know, positive powers. I don't know, some other people may call it something else, or it's a spirit or whatever. Uh, but we need to call on that as well, you know, through meditation, through um, prayer and so forth. Um, plus, do a bit. We do need to do a bit. And this is what I like to tell people. This new world order is going to literally bulldoze us into oblivion. You know, they was. Is that what you want for your kids? Because that's coming. If you don't do something, it's coming. Those wild lands are coming. Those bio regions are coming. They're doing it very insidiously. So if you don't know what's going on, and you don't protest. It's going to roll over you. Actually, I can. So, I we should probably bring this to a close. Go ahead. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry. Do we have do we have three more minutes? I just I just wanted to show one thing because um I wanted to back up absolutely um everything you said because in the meantime I found finally um the tweets that I sent um which is these um I I sent out tweets about the genocide rate that's announced and I think these numbers are pretty accurate uh, based on their plans. So in the next seven years, so these are my tweets starting at one eight three zero. Um, so the U.S. genocide rate is 83%. For the U.K., um, sorry, for the U.K., it's 78%. That's the one down here. Um, for Germany, it's 62%. Okay, so two out of three people are, are to be slaughtered, uh, murdered. And for Switzerland, it's a third. So every third person in Switzerland is also to be murdered. And um, I emphasize Switzerland because it's a small country, you know. Um, so for them, it will be devastating. Um, but I, I want to emphasize that um, it, this is, even though this is their plans, it, it doesn't mean that it's practical simply for the reason, and I've made this point a long time ago, th they have these, these guiding numbers and their plans for genocide because to first order, and that's the first um, premise and the last, they are sick in the head. They are psychopaths, they are mentally deranged and they have to be bay corrected. They are clinically insane. This is not a logical or practical thing. And the reason why it's not practical to genocide the entire population, even though, you know, there might be days when we feel like it, you know, um, especially when you're trying to find a parking space in Switzerland, is because our systems have gone so complex 
that debugging and making our systems work, and this could be anything, this could be especially software, which runs pretty much everything these days, but any other system, you know, if you start killing off a massive side of your supply chain or the expertise, you will bring the entire economy to a grinding halt. You cannot, I mean, these people do calculations because they run their businesses. And the reason why they don't want to um, genocide India, by the way, India also plans to kill off a couple of million, but it doesn't show in the number because they've got such a high birth rate. So if the, if the population stays the same over seven years, they're still killing a bunch of people, but you know, the population still kind of you know keeps its numbers um but the reason why they don't want to genocide 83 percent of the indians is because that's where they have all the factories that's where they have all the the core centers in china and india and they exactly, think oh, exactly that's already which is already in action you know they've got the little supply line going although it seems there's also plans to make the us and the europe into slave labor you know yeah. Exactly. And I think this is why they're bringing all the immigrants into Europe is because they are planning um, to invert, you know, the system. So they are planning to kill off the middle class, slosh in uneducated people with absolutely zero connections and networks who are pretty helpless here in Germany, because they will also take about, you know, a year to learn the language and 10 years to build up a solid, um, stable existence. And then in that time, you can totally enslave them. And that's the entire system, the entire plan. And when I'm talking to these uber rich people in Switzerland who are multimillionaires, they have to, you know, watch it because they are to be genocided as well. And the only reason why it's only 33% is because the entire population is smaller than the population of London. Okay, but still they will be decimated and every third person here in Switzerland is to be murdered over the next seven years, you know. So when I'm talking to the uh, Nachrichtendienst des Bundes, Swiss Intel, and we're giving them this information that the plan is to genocide every third Swiss and they don't care, then these people need to be removed, right, from the military HQ in Switzerland because they've just committed high treason against all the other Eidgenossen, and all the other Swiss um, citizens. But one number, I just want to, sorry, one thing I want to flash up for court use, anybody who tries to Baker Act you because they don't believe in directed energy weapons, flash the... Um, global market analysis and directed energy weapons um, at them, which states that um, the, the size of the market in 2016 was 8 billion, and it's going to reach 42 billion by 2023. Okay, so in, you know, over the next five years, the global market in directed energy weapons alone will be 42 billion. And then also this market analysis further down, I think, I think it's this one. Um, I can tweet it out. This, it has a list of all the companies um, that are, no, I don't think it's this one. I have to find it. But it's on this site where they are listing all the um, police forces and all the intelligence agencies, but also local police forces like Greater Manchester Police who have bought directed energy weapons and are buying them. So when Yes, and that's... <laughs> had reported as well documents i think that information was that report bio.com yeah exactly exactly and it's also linked on my website under the faq so people can get there because you know what we need to... yeah we post some collection sites whereby people can get a look at you know the rfid industry for instance the brain chip industry, the BCI industry, and the, you know, the robotics industry, and this, you know, the, the directed energy weapons industry. See, people can see how it's growing. Absolutely. No, I really think so. And um, I know we want to wrap up. And the only thing I wanted to say is that for this reason, because the genocide has, has been pretty firmly already announced, I think, uh, you know, oh, sorry, but just one last thing. Sorry, this is so important for court use. Uh, just let me just uh, share my screen one last time and point people to a, a new video I made. So if you go to um, YouTube and you go to my channel, I put out a new video um, where I film myself between 2.30 a.m. and 4.30 a.m. It's called Machine Gunning Evidence for Court. Okay, it's a 12-minute video, and I put it out there and I annotated it so that you can use it. But one of the things that's spectacular that I managed to record is that I managed to um, catch um, how I'm being shot in the face so hard that you can see the entire, um, 
what's it called the metal uh the the alu foil that i had to basically put it on my head and you can see me being shot in the face and this entire foil move so i'm just lying there sleeping and then this was the shot so the sort of massive shots that i get to the head so you know and there's a replay but basically you can use this video and here it is again okay and um what you can see there is that i'm being shot in the face so hard that the entire metal is being moved and this is inside my bunker where i've got as you can see reflectix here reflectix on the outside extra layers of metal here and so on and so on so you know this is spectacular but you can people can take that video and download it and use it straight for court and also in the description i have linked the full two hour video that you also should download and put it um burn it on cd and put it into your court bundle as evidence so this is the mutilation live mutilation here in switzerland and um, just recorded four four or five days ago you did a great job and i think that's probably good advice to everybody to start doing that kind of recording you know stick a camera and cover yourself with whatever because i can hear the shots and reflectix when i put like a cookie sheet with reflectix above me on a cushion you know and i stick it on my head first thing whack 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 very loud loud sounds as i'm trying to go to bed so those are the pulse oh. energy projectiles and then i think when people have for example joint ache what they are actually feeling is these when these pulse energy projectiles are hit into the body most of the energy get that gets absorbed by the bones and i think there's a thin layer of nerves on the bone i think I, i'm not a, you know i'm not an expert on anatomy but that's basically what you're feeling uh, and, and as also open brackets i think we should look at diseases like osteoporosis and think could this possibly be induced by dues where you get your bones get shot to smithereens and combine that with the um, um x-rays of millicent's knee where you can see the bone being uh, exploded away over just two or four years or something like that yeah i know it's extraordinary what they're doing all these diseases that they are um inducing so did you guys want to do like a last minute uh, a roundup of anything you'd like to present before we close well i would just like to say that um <clears throat> ramon and i were talking about the fact that we need to call yet again for a ban on these weapons period because human beings are not moral enough to have this type of technology because the very first thing that we thought to do with this technology is harm each other silently and in a most cowardly fashion. So I am, um, as a former uh, National Security Agency intelligence analyst, saying not only do I personally call for this ban, but as a, a professional, I call for this ban because people are not fit to have this type of technology. We're just not. And so all of it should be illegal and we should have a time period where it's very well advertised that if you have anything like this, you turn it in. Or if you're caught with it later, death penalty or life in prison, period. Period. Totally forbidden technology for the sake of all of humanity. This is fantastic. And, and let me back that up straight away because um, I've, I've talked to um, um, Alfred Weber, and Alfred Weber was working with um, Dr. Ronnie Kilder. And um, it, well, when I talked to Melanie, who also worked with Dr. Ronnie Kilder, she said that uh, they, they murdered uh, Dr. Kilder when she was really starting to work with the European Parliament to enact a total ban of, of all these um, weaponry, of, of directed energy weapons and neurotech. And, um, and now I was trying to trace down what she was working on, and actually, um, Alfred Weber was involved, and now I think we should um, go back there and, and actually enact it here for the European Parliament. So I think the step forward is if, if you guys are working on that in the US, we should lockstep and here in Europe approach the European Parliament. Switzerland has to be approached separately because they're not exactly in the EU, but then again are bound by the laws of the EU and have to put them into force here as well. So I think this is the way to go. And, and um, you know, maybe we should link up on that and then with Alfred Weber and actually get this going because he, he I think he uh, was looking for the bundle that um, they used for the European Parliament. So there's lots of work already on that exactly to enact a ban and that's where that's where we should um you know really take it and and i'm making this absolutely public because last time you know dr kilder was working on it more or less uh, discreetly 
and and then she was murdered so now we're making it all public we're all working on this together so you know two fingers to the intel agencies um but what i wanted to say as a as a finishing remark is that in all this i mean you know when you watch this video about how i'm being machine gunned this is not just one night this machine gunning right now from swiss intel is permanent that's why I have to sit in here. As during the show, I've got joint ache because they're machine gunning me. I've got my helmet here that I'm wearing throughout the day, you know. And um, But it's now so bad, and it's extremely hard not to be disheartened. Last night, I was in so much pain, sleeping under my desk. I basically, for the first time in this war, I broke down crying. That's not going to happen again, guys, by the way. If Inter hopes it's going to be a regular thing, I'm going to just stress, okay? I had a long day. But um, I know that a lot of victims are in this and they are going through extreme pain, extreme humiliation. And with this entire neurotech, uh, they, are, they are basically being put through death camp experiments, Nazi experiments, and it's extremely hard to cope. But one of the things I want to say is if you if you are in need of hope and i think a lot of us are you just have to know one thing the system is now in a phase where it's not linear anymore and what that means is that it, it's now in the butterfly effect uh you know a part of this entire phase which means that a very small change or action can have huge uh consequences so for example ramola's memo had a huge consequence because now the entirety of the us has put human trafficking as the epidemic as you know on the top shelf and what i want to say is that you can replicate what you know ramola's memo has done all around the world so please do you know now is the time when you are going to have the biggest impact that you can ever have on a government or on the entire human system because it is entirely non-linear and if you're really looking for non-linear effects i would say the reason why the cartel didn't anticipate what, what's happening there now and cannot cope is because we're now in a, in, in a highly networked situation. And I'm telling you guys, <laughs> network mathematics is still being developed, okay? So the entire tools and the insights are still being literally, you know, thought up about and tested by the mathematicians and the system physicists as we speak. So there's no way that 30 or 40 years ago, people could have anticipated it because the mathematics wasn't there to even, you know, quantitatively assess the problem. So there's, this is the big leveler, you know, there's no way these people could have possibly guessed what's gonna happen because they didn't even have the tools. We never ever had a situation like this. So um, if you're looking for courage, we're now in a phase where yes, things can be changed overnight, just like Sweden has changed overnight. That's a non-linear change. And now you really, I'm, I'm telling you, if you want to be do campaigning ever at some point in your life, do it this year, because this year your campaigning will have a huge nonlinear effect on the system, more than you could have ever had in any of the previous millennia. So if you can get your you know, ass off your chair at any point in your life, do it this year, do it now. Are you back, Ramola? <laughs> we lost you there. Absolutely. You know, I'm sorry, the audio is so garbled at my end. Can you hear me okay? Yes, now we can. You can? You can. Okay. I just wanted to, you know, follow up on what you both said and echo the same thing. We do need to call for a universal global ban on electromagnetic weapons, on the use of electromagnetic weapons on the populace and the use of them by anybody on anybody else. And that includes, in my point of view, the military. I think the military is sitting back watching this and laughing, you know, thinking, yeah, 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 you think you can ban us from doing what we want. We've got our particle beam weapons, we've got our plasma weapons, we've got our lasers and mesas, and we're not going to stop just just because you know a bunch of women tell us that we should stop well i would i would suggest that we need to start a movement we need to make connections with every anti-war world beyond war style you know organization and who by the way is not acknowledging these weapons we are go ahead catherine can you click on your image because i've just seen as i was trying to copy the chat that it's all on me and they people can just see me click around so click on your own image so that we have you full screen for your for your final word do you see 
Oh, really? Okay, my goodness. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, so yeah, so I was just saying that, you know, to bring forward and put forward this information ourselves. And as you said, Catherine, let's work together across US, across Europe, work with Alfred Weber, who has, who developed the, the language for the, for what was presented to the European Parliament in 1999, and who's also developed the language now for a model statute. And, um, you know, I was speaking with Melanie a little bit about it. Melanie, is, you know, is the founder of ICATOR, the leading uh, European organization at this point in time that is addressing these issues about electromagnetic weapons and covert implantation. So hopefully we can work with her and with you, Catherine, and with Alfred uh, from our side of the pond over here in the US. And also, I hope, make bridges and connections with other uh, human rights organizations in the US and Europe that are concerned with war and weaponry. Uh, you know, that are anti-war and anti-weapon use so that we can work together to bring this information forward because we are talking about uh, really addressing very large industries, the directed energy weapons industry. I forget the number that you mentioned, Catherine. It's uh, multi-billions and trillions and whatnot, right? Okay. And uh, they've and they've spent decades building these up. So we are standing up as victims of crimes using electromagnetic weapons on our person, you know, and electromagnetic weapons on our person as well as neurotechnology. So in a sense, we are going to be calling for a ban on neurotechnology and electromagnetic weapon reuse that's detrimental to the human body that engages and involves the manipulation of the human body and the human brain. We are against the manipulation of the human body and the human brain. That should be sort of a basic tenet of humanity, that we should be able to protect our human bodies and human brains, right? As well as animals. We are sticking up for the animals as well. Um, but somebody needs to step forward and do that and say that, and hopefully we'll continue. You know, we're just sort of mentioning it right now. We